joining us this week is Robert Schmitz. If you have not seen his YouTube channel, I highly suggest checking it out. The link will be in the description below. I'm so happy to be here. This is about the best moment we've had as Bears fans all season long. Like for once, it feels as if everybody's opinion on how the future can work out for Chicago feels like it's starting to meet in the middle where we're not bad enough for anybody to reasonably cheer for number one and number three anymore. We're not good enough for everybody to be sold and super duper toxic about like, this is the way going forward. And if you think anything else, you're silly, right? And now we're all on the same page. Let's just win some games, baby. And the bears catch a flagging Browns team at the perfect time with an untested quarterback that hasn't gotten heated up the way that the bears have been able to put teams in the pressure cooker. And man, I, j I know you were just saying, hi, how you doing? But the answer is I am stoked to see how this goes because the bears win this next Sunday. They could easily end up eight and eight and should fate align. Maybe that means that you get a win in your end game with green Bay in week 18. And there would be no more cinematic way to end this season. Yeah. It's unfortunate looking back on it, that right now the Bears should be, and could be seven and six, two games away that were very, not a game that we, uh, that other teams won, but really the bears lost. It's a shame because right now you are kind of in control and if you're anywhere near seven and six and on the way to like nine to 10 wins. I think this is an absurdly successful season comparatively to what me and Polly were really expecting. So even the last few weeks, I've just been rooting for wins. I have no interest in draft picks anymore and I'm just rooting for wins. That was my thing at the beginning of the year. I said, you know, I, I don't care so much about how sloppy this year is going to be. I want wins. This is what's important to me this year. I was willing to take a step back last year and sacrifice the wins for the draft pick. And, and you, everybody saw what that panned out to another potential first overall pick. So it was definitely worth doing last year. However, two years in a row, I don't feel comfortable sitting there rooting for my team to lose. The crazy part is that when we look back at our predictions, um, me and David both had them around seven wins. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in that seven wins, though, we had them winning two games in the first four weeks. So for this team to go 0-4 and, and still be in a position where they can not only get seven wins but more after starting 0-4 is actually a very, very positive end result here. What I've found frustrating about this season, and Dave, you kind of hinted at it, you gave me a springboard I wanted to just dive into, is that I would argue this team has been near best case scenario in terms of talent development. Darnell Wright is a year ahead of schedule. Braxton Jones seems like the real deal. A player who I'm not allowed to legally name because if at the moment I do, I'll jinx him, has been healthy all year, save his early IR stint. And he's been the best lineman on the Bears, which has been awesome. And that's just the offensive line. Like, that's before we talk about a defensive line where Andrew Billings is playing like Dexter Lawrence light. That's before we talk about Montez Sweat and the addition that he's meant. That's before we talk about Kyler Gordon's resurgence. Jalen Johnson stepped forward into a corner one. I mean, truly, a Bears fan with an Xbox couldn't build a team with this much talent on it. And yet they're five and eight. You are allowed to be very disappointed. I would argue that the way that this Bears schedule has worked out, you could tell me that this Bears team should be eight and five, and I would agree with you because that Buccaneers game was right there for the taking. And if you don't want to give them the Buccaneers game, how about the Saints game where they had four opportunities to tie the game and instead went 0 for 4 in critical situations? Everybody wants to focus on just Denver and just the Lions game. There were so many more opportunities that the Bears didn't capitalize on, and now, now they're just playing too well to lose. Like, at this stage, the defense is basically playing so well that to lose would just be a dang shame, right? It's a funny scenario to be looking at because I still think this team's record is seriously, seriously underperformant. I don't know where else to assign the blame on that than the head coaching, but the roster couldn't be in better shape. You know what I mean? And me and Polly are kind of football fans produced by the 2000s, like Tom Brady, right. Peyton Manning, Drew Brees, Phillip Rivers, right? And I think the 2000s broke our brains in the sense of the quarterback position because I think you just got used to seeing like 300 yards, three touchdowns, no picks from like multiple guys. Right. And I think that that era was kind of just like defined by the fact that there was a few guys that were exceptional and they could kind of take advantage of guys who were just out there playing football. Right now, I feel like 
the quarterback position has caught up to the rest of the league where you kind of have to treat it like any other position. If a guy shines in his rookie year, great. If he's not by year two, then there's something to worry about, like a receiver or running back or any other position. And then by year three, if the guy's just not there, like the guy's just not there. In an interview with Tom Brady, he spoke about how when he entered the league, the rules were so much more against them. And over time, the, the, uh, the officiating has gone towards the quarterback position to make it easier. And he said he feels that younger quarterbacks don't have to play as well in order to be good nowadays, whereas he had to. And he he lived through that transition. So I think the talent gap between all quarterbacks is a lot smaller than it used to be. That's why we're seeing guys like Brock Purdy able to come into the league and succeed. It's a, it's a team game. I mean, it seems as if, like you're talking about, after during around, what, 2008 to 2017, it was as if people wanted to act as if the offense is one player while the defense is 11, right? But it's always been an 11 on 11 game, and especially as defenses starting around, I would argue, about Patrick Mahomes' tenure. Yeah, I do think it's him. The defense has started shifting away from copying the Legion of Boom and what they were able to do through cover three and shifting to more cover two, cover four looks. And that's incentivized dinking and dunking. So what do you need if you're going to dink and dunk? You need playmakers. You need guys that are going to be able to punish you in the open field. It's part of why DJ Moore is so well fit for the current edition of the league. Is he Jamar Chase? Like in terms of copy paste no he's basically a running back with a wide receiver skill set and he's been dominant because when he breaks a tackle there's nobody there to take him away and it's awesome to see that the bears are adding playmakers like that because it helps nearly any quarterback that they field play really well now it's funny that you mentioned the top quarterback versus everybody else argument if only because we have still seen the super bowl winner either be the current existing best quarterback in the league it, at a time it was brady now it's patrick mahomes or it is a total grab bag of nearly anything else right we ha- we've got nick Foles. he won a super bowl we've got matt stafford top 10 quarterback but right there on the line of top 10 quarterback right joe flacco and joe flacco but it, 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 exactly Exactly. There are there is a host of other guys that seem to reach the Super Bowl. But when you're not a top 10 quarterback, it seems as if you lose the game. Now, there's honestly not enough Super Bowls for us to really draw definitive conclusions, right? Like it's a it's too much of a guessing game to predict exactly what gets you through the tournament. But I agree with you in practice that you need a good team. You can't be fielding Marcus Valdez-Scantling and Sky Moore and Rushi Rice and calling it a day. That just doesn't work. And there's an argument to be made that it never quite did, that guys like Julian Edelman, Wes Welker shined brighter than we gave them credit for at the time. But we can also leave that aside and say the way that defenses at that moment were defending the run game like hell on earth meant that you had open passing seams that a lot of these quarterbacks just don't get right now in 2023. It's a complex nut to crack, but to your point, the run game and your ability to work underneath matters a lot more than it used to. It's why before he broke, Mac Jones was looking as successful as he was. Now Brock Purdy and plenty of others that are more that distributed point guard player are starting to shine, whereas big threats in different forms and fashions are finding it harder to str- or to win on a down to down basis. Your theory of team building, right. Is do you stick with Justin Fields and, you know, go and add, you know, if you trade the first overall pick, you're probably getting three first round picks out of it. So you're probably drafting three first round talents that, that next draft. And then versus now you have Caleb Williams plus maybe one, you know, pass rusher or a, a toy for him. But I think that was just my roundabout way of like, will that exceptional rookie potentially take you further than a better team and then a plug and play quarterback? I think just based on how we're asking this question, you can kind of feel the way we feel about it, you know, totally. Uh, which is we've, you know, we've just been preaching the Brock Purdy, Jalen Hurts, Joe, uh, Josh Allen model, and even arguably Patrick Mahomes, because those were like 10, 9, 11 win teams before they even plugged those guys in. Think about this. Tom Brady, in the middle of his career, when he went out, what did that team go? Bam, 11, 11 and, five and 5 with Matt Castle. So oh, if, that doesn't, if that doesn't say something, like even throughout his career, 
surrounded by a good team. And that is the overall plan to success. I mean, that's the one team that sat there and won Super Bowl after Super Bowl after Super Bowl over and over. Coach, so, I what I, if there's one thing about the Justin Fields quandary that I think is really complicated, it's that Fields is a very, very niche quarterback. Like you're saying, right now, the total package is without a doubt a top 10 starting quarterback. You're looking at a super athlete that can hit huge shots downfield, especially when players like DJ Moore get open for them. So what's not to like? Well, we just described that the league is trending towards dink and dunk, like make a play here and there, facilitate your offense quarterbacking. And that doesn't feel as if it's Justin Fields' strong suit at this point, which doesn't mean Fields can't work. It just means look at a game like Sunday and there's the whole package all rolled into one. Fields took, what do you think, guys? Five? absolutely ferocious hits that's not to amalgamate all of the hits total right but that's Robert, just talking you, about the nasty ones you do the you study the tape right uh, i mean tell me if i'm wrong i just feel there's consistently missed layups when we're talking about dump offs uh, we saw a couple passes last game that were just high for no reason it was short passes Totally. But I also, to kind of what Dave is saying, want to make it clear that Fields isn't the only one that misses some of these. Jared Goff played a really poor game against the Bears, and the Bears were exposing, in my opinion, his poor eyes. I mean, Jared Goff has always had trouble with when the defense changes, especially while Jared Goff is feeding play action in some capacity. And the Bears basically challenged him to make more than a half field read within three seconds. And Jared really struggled to do it. So I don't want to make it sound as if what we're putting on Justin Fields is you have to be the perfect quarterback or else you're out. It's not that simple, right? But when you do pass on a top prospect, the question becomes, is that guy going to facilitate a better passing attack? Is that what you want to do going forward? And honestly, I, I'm not trying to push anybody towards one thing or another. Not right now, because Fields at this moment is playing really well. I mean, he's certainly upping his trade value in a worst case scenario, or he's giving you something that you can build on. And my question that I would be asking if I was Ryan Poles is, do we think we can sustain this long term? Or are we heading towards a point where Fields' body is going to give out at, and we're going to end up left with a team that is ready to win, playing a backup trying to do it? Now, that backup might succeed. There was a point where Jalen Hurts backed up Carson Wentz. There was a point where Brock Purdy backed up Jimmy Garoppolo. Like you guys are talking about, having somebody waiting in the wings is not impossible when you get three first-round picks in the 2024, 2025, and 2026 drafts. There's just a lot of ways to do this. And the good news is, is that I believe that both paths it basically convene at the same point where we want a team that's ready to roll around the quarterback. And the good news is the Bears team right now is playing pretty good ball. Like if you put a rookie quarterback in with this team, plus the Malik neighbors pick that you're talking about, Dave, or whatever other prospect you wanted to fit in there add a center in the in the free agency, make the moves that everybody on Twitter keeps talking about, right? You're going to end up with a team that might not have the history that the Kansas City Chiefs did when they replaced Alex Smith with Patrick Mahomes, but you should have a team that matches that talent level. And if you want proof, just take a look at the Patriots. Just take a look at the Giants. Those are much more normal situations for a high-touted rookie to fall into. I think that either way, no matter what happens, I doubt Ryan Poles is going to make a million friends in Chicago, but I also think that nearly any person, this is my hope anyways, that whatever happens, people are going to come around to it because whether it's the people that wanted to stick with a quarter or wanted to stick with fields that don't get their way or the people that wanted a new quarterback that don't get their way, I tend to think the Bears are going to have a team that's capable of winning quite a few games regardless come 2024 and 2025, and 2026. The foundation looks really well set right now, which I'm shocked I'm able to say. This is Chicago. They don't do that. Like The fields in the first discussion, first pick discussion is going to be like a distraction until the draft happens. It's unavoidable. Okay, It's going to be a distraction. I don't want to speak on the potential new QB because even if you have the first pick and you take Drake May and then you take or you missed out on Caleb Williams, like this draft previous showed us that, Like, and me and Paulie have never said anything other than uh, – one of my favorite phrases of his is just get more darts for the dartboard. Receivers the dartboard. this year. 
Look at the wide receivers taking this year. The guys yeah. producing the most or the what? The guys taking the latest. Yeah. It's frustrating. I, honestly, I think because everything feels as easy as get more darts for the dartboard and then bada boom, you're good to go. But it becomes funny when you take a look at all these first round contracts. First round contracts are like a mid tier free agent. Like they're not that cheap in the wide world of things. If the player is really good, absolutely they are. The number one overall pick isn't even cheap. Like it's cheap for a quarterback, but you're going to be paying, let's say it's Caleb Williams, $10 million a year over the next four years, like each year. It's not, it's cheaper than paying, say, Justin Fields $50 million a year, but quarterback's expensive, right? Let alone if you pick another position, Marvin Harrison making $7 million a year, it's going to feel cheap to some people if he gets the usage. And it feels so funny to me looking around the league because I'm amazed at how good the Bears look right now. I mean, call me crazy if you want to. You're more than welcome to because this feels like every time the Bears win, we get a little too high on the team. But it surprises me, guys, looking around the league, where if you want to be frustrated with the Bears' level of talent, you're more than welcome to. The rest of the league is not that good. You oh, know what no, I mean? We did, a, we did this. We did a, uh, a poll. We literally went through every single team and we did a ranking of situations. And it's completely subjective, but we're just like, whose situation would you rather have overall as a package? You can replace head coaches. Head coaches get replaced by good teams. But in terms of like talent and then draft capital and then all of the contracts and all that stuff, we put it at like what 14th best situation in the league. You know, I don't like this conversation of Williams versus Fields because it's never going to be. It's a, it's a question that you can't even get an answer to, not when it gets drafted, but like two years after that, because then you have to see how Williams shakes out and how Fields looks on his new team. You so, can't even get a good answer now. Like, that's exactly. It's as simple as, let, let me, let's use some pretend scenarios, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're Ryan Poles, and you go out and you get an unsanctioned dinner with Caleb Williams because you have the first overall pick, and yeah, people cheat. Get over it, mm -hmm. right? And as you're sitting at dinner, you've got, say, Atlanta, right? Burning a hole in your pocket. Their GM has been calling and calling and calling, saying, I don't care what you're asking for. You want Drake London, three firsts, a second round pick? Done. Like, take it. And as you're sitting there with Caleb Williams, kind of gives you the vibe that he just doesn't really care that much. Suddenly, your decision's made. It's that easy, right? On the other side of things, maybe you're sitting at the same dinner with Caleb Williams. The guy is wowing you, saying everything you could possibly want. And you got a separate GM. I don't know. Let's say it's um, the Raiders make a little bit of sense for this. And they want to give you a first and a third for Justin Fields. Is the decision made at that point if you're getting insane value for the quarterback you already have? We don't know. We don't know any of this. We don't know what these guys' characters are like. We don't know what the trade packages that are going to get offered are going to be. But I have a feeling that the market value of whatever Fields is going to end up gathering from other teams is going to play a lot of a role in this. Because the moment that, to your point, you get three first-round picks in this draft alone, maybe the calculus changes. But it's just not that simple. And everybody keeps trying to simplify it. Like It sounds like the worst decision is to like keep fields and keep the first pick. So if you're take, keeping fields and taking Marvin Harrison, that sounds probably like the worst value added. That's probably the worst one. You got to trade yeah. down from number one at that point. Right. Um, <laughs> so like, do, do you think that this conversation at this point has a negative effect on the locker room or fields mentality or fields desire to stay here? Do you think there is any, cause I feel like the only backdoor shenanigan we could hear about uh, is that, the entire time Ryan Poles just texts Justin Fields or sees him after, you know, on a Monday or Tuesday and goes like, dude, you got to ignore all this because I swear to God, we're not getting rid of you. A lot of people are acting like this has to happen right now. Like we still have another year with Fields and then potentially a fifth year option. And so it doesn't have to happen right now. The reason why we feel that way is the pressure from having another first overall pick in back to back years. I see a lot of people that make it look like either option is super duper dire, right? The Bears are in the middle of a rebuild and half their players are ahead of schedule. Like, call me crazy, but if you, if they didn't have many resources, I would still feel pretty good. Not amazing, but pretty good about the future of the team. And now they their roster 
is playing out as if they spent all their cap and even front or backloaded a bunch of their deals. And instead, they've got nearly a hundred million dollars in cap space once you cut Cody White hair and unfortunately part with Eddie Jackson, right? And once you do that, you've got quite a tidy sum to spend in free agency. The quarterback thing is so funny because I keep hearing it called really risky, and I don't want to take away from you. You got this pick for freezies, more or less. I know, I know you traded for it, but you don't have to trade up. You didn't even have to lose to get to this point. Another right, it's team, not like you have these back-to-back -back picks because you suck back-to-back -back years. No, right. you, you suck the one year, right. You, no, you suck the one year, and then you managed to take the best weapon away from a team who drafted arguably the wrong quarterback. I'm not a big Bryce Young guy, and, and never really was, but I'm trying not to victory lap because that's just no fun. Like, that's just mm -hmm. great dancing, right? Results are results. So you end up with this team that, like you're talking about, you mentioned this, Paul. I think it's hilarious. They're a team that is losing so emphatically that they're going to wrap up number one early at this rate. Like, they couldn't even do us a favor and take it to the end of the season and make us, like, consider that the Bears would have this, that, or the other. The Patriots and the Cardinals even stepped out of the way over the last couple of weeks. It, it's honestly pretty frustrating. Because like you're talking about, that there are people – I saw this on Reddit the other day. I thought it was hilarious. There are people that are now beginning to act like the Bears having a top two pick is an outright bad thing. And it's like, no, this is a great thing, regardless of what happens with it. It's like it, you couldn't ask for a better asset. And I believe – this is really, I guess, my core – that whether you took the rookie or not, you are going to build this team up. It's just a matter of which direction are you going to use it. Right? Are you going to pour one of your biggest resources in an attempt to upgrade your core passing game? Because Justin Fields as a quarterback is a very unusual quarterback. He buffs out your run game. Like, uh, I don't know how you guys, what language you use to speak, right? But I'll, I can always think of like video game statistics and little bonuses and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Like, Justin Fields is a multiplier on the ground. He is outstanding in that department. You play man against him, you're going to get a lot of the same results that you got uh, in this last Lions game, where early on, I don't know that Justin Fields was seeing what was going on downfield outstandingly well. It didn't matter. If Aiden, if Aiden Hutchinson tries to arm tackle him in the pocket, Justin Fields is going to get out of that. He's going to sprint upfield, and in the blink of an eye, he has 20 yards. Nobody else can do that in the league. Like, yeah, David uh, mentioned in week one how the Packers are a, a very man coverage team and they played like 95% zone against Fields. Exactly. That is the game and that's where, that's where this gets questionable. And we'll see what happens over the next four games because the Lions are man heavy to a fault. Fields played two really strong games against the Lions. In the middle of that was a Minnesota game where it felt as if, sure, the team around him didn't have a phenomenal outing. But if there becomes, I think you guys would agree, a book on how to beat Fields, we would all agree that's a problem. But it's the wrong week to say that because mm. Fields looked like a dynamo against the Lions. And if he could do that against a flagging Browns team and a Carolina or and a Cardinals team that's not a very strong defense and an Atlanta Falcons defense that's also not all that great, well then it sounds like it would take a pretty good defense to put Fields in a bind. And that becomes a different conversation. There's an element of risk either way, right? Because if we if we do all this, we get to eight and eight, we go up against the Packers, Fields scores 13 points. In a in yet another 27 to 13 game where everybody just goes, I cannot believe I got excited for this, right? Then we're all gonna have ice in our souls as we just stare down the barrel of two risky decisions, right? But like you're talking about, Paul, I think there are just so many positive things we can talk about that aren't how are the bears gonna screw up the quarterback because we're so scarred as Bears fans over the last 10 years, that we're always going to look at the negative. And I can't help but see this as, if Fields distinguishes himself, you're good.